Good morning. Good to see y'all. How's it going? Okay, so we're average. Good. We're far. Um, I had many good bits of good news. I did turn in my ordination papers, which was approximately 75 pages of theological and personal discourse, along with multiple forms. I've already been to a psychiatrist three times, and not a doctor once. Now I've got to disclose my finances as well. And so there is no part of me that has gone un <laughs> unexamined by the conference. They accepted the papers as complete, which is good because if you get one thing mislabeled, they defer you an entire year. <laughs> and uh, so in March, I will go before a board. Um, and in January, I have a pastor's retreat, which is actually a delight. So, and then after, if the board approves, an annual conference in June, I will finally be ordained four, uh, five years after being originally ordained and after, no, four years after being originally ordained, six years after being in ministry, and eight years since I began seminary. And that's par. <laughs> Could have done it one year sooner, but uh, we were busy around here. You know, Olivia. Anyway, so that's good news. We had a fantastic day yesterday at our leadership uh, seminar. Um, if you would like any information that is part of that, I have that, and I'll give it to you after worship, and I have it in the fellowship hall. I don't have a lot of announcements typed in the bulletin because I was working on those papers and the leadership retreat. So uh, you will see that I still, I don't need vol more volunteers to plan the food boxes. I have lots of people that are organizing that and are putting those together Monday, the 19th of November. If you want to join, you're welcome to, but we do have enough help. That's at 9 o'clock. I do have some items that I need donated. So I still have some pies, some corn, carrot, a bunch of turkeys, and packages of rolls. Now, this is like a breaking news alert. So if you go to Kroger, at least between now and Tuesday, and the supplies have not run out, if you spend a normal $25 of groceries, which I just happen to be doing, getting beverages for the retreat, you can buy up to two turkeys at 49 cents a pound. That might be turkeys you want to donate. It might be turkeys you need for your house. Both is totally understandable. But if you were thinking about something affordable and very helpful to donate, wow, it says two turkeys. Look at that. That's amazing. I spent $13 getting two turkeys of about 12, 13 pounds each. That was amazing. So I ripped up one of these because I it's already in the freezer. Because I don't have freezer space at home. So I've already brought it to the church. And so I just wanted you to know if you already go to Kroger and you're already going to spend 25 hours. If you say, but Pastor, I don't have the $12 to spend, but I'm going to get Kroger anyway. If you buy them, I'll give you $12 or $13. Like, it's that good of a deal. Okay, so during the service, whatever you would like to donate, uh, on the back it tells you when and where and how to bring it back. Next Sunday, anytime, uh, would be great. Next Sunday, we have regular church as normal, and then we have our Thanksgiving service at 530 we're going to be joined by Bell Springs United Methodist and Mount Zion Baptist and Eddie Buckingham, who I think most of you have seen and heard from Mount Zion and here in Nova, who will be preaching. So that's exciting. Um, uh, so do come to that. It is a wonderful service. It's always tons of fun. The potluck is always the best one the whole year because it's Thanksgiving, so people bring extra, which I'm like, you know, your stomachs don't get bigger. But people bring extra, and it's lovely. So I definitely encourage that. That will take the place of youth that night, as you would expect. Um, I think I had other announcements. Uh, let me write in my head. Do it? Monica. Yes. Yeah, on the 28th, Wednesday night, well, it's the Wednesday after Thanksgiving, we will have um, our Wednesday evening meal. But then as a family, each family is going, we're going to have supplies. You're going to make an advent wreath to take home to use with your family. 
Um, so there'll be one for family. If, if you're the only one in your household, you'll make one. And you'll, you'll have it to take home, and we have the verses and the guidelines that go with it. So that's on Wednesday night, the 28th after dinner. And we'll just all, in the fellowship hall, we'll clean up our tables, and we'll build our wreaths. Yes, and that will take place of the regular lessons and all that age groups. Yes. Yeah, so November, Wednesday, the 28th, please come out if you are able, because we're going to be making Advent wreaths for you to take home, but nice ones, not like super cheap, right? But really cool. I saw this once in North Carolina, and it was a big hit, and people loved it. It was fun because the family could do it together. Thank you. Am I forgetting something? Any other announcements? Yeah. Oh, yes, Kroger also has veg canned vegetables for you that since you can buy 10. So if you're thinking of something else to donate, we've got corns, carrots still. Yeah, thank you. I almost forgot. But it's not carrots, though. It's not carrots? No, it's green beans, green peas, and corn. Corn. Great. We still have we still have meat for corn. We don't need the green beans. Any other announcements I'm forgetting? I feel like I'm forgetting uh, Well, I will say that uh, Thanksgiving is early this year. It's the 22nd, I believe. And that Wednesday night, right before the 21st, we will not have Wednesday night dinner, as you would expect. Any others? What are we decorating? We're decorating the church. Before the quilt walk, right? The week after. Sunday after Thanksgiving. So it'll be there. November 25th. At 6 30. So we're going back work. At 6 30? At 6 30? Okay. Sunday. Okay. Sunday, November 25th, we will be decorating the church for Christmas. Yes. So if you like to do that kind of thing, please come. And it will be like earlier in the afternoon, like 4 or 4 30. What? It's 4 30. I'll have all that in the bulletin for you next week as well. Well, at this time, if there's no other further announcements, I encourage you to move about the room and pass in the love and peace of Jesus Christ to one another. The peace of Christ be with you all.
let it be. Take my life. And 
Congresses. But the, this country and its, its military and its leaders have led the world to what's called the Pax Americana, a long period of sustained and incredibly uh, peaceful world compared to what humanity experienced in the 20th and 19th centuries and before. So my prayer and praise is for those who have helped make that peace so that my daughter Olivia can live in this world, so that I can live in this world, so that we can worship and be engaged in mission in this peaceful world. Amen. All right. A hundred years ago, World War One. They, they they were so they were so so prideful. This war was <laughs> all wars. <laughs> you can't end all wars until Christ comes back. But I like to think that we can we can be better than we have been in the past. So, all right. Also pray for my wife. She's two three days now, just feeling very sick. Um, low grade fever, you know, probably ear infection or sinus infection. But it's just, she's just sort of laid out and her climate, she's okay. Olivia's doing great. She had teething fever, but the, it was not a cold. So. What other prayers and praises would you like to lift up this morning? Anything else? Praise for the conference yesterday. They all? Thank you. It was, it was very informative. Barb did a great job. He did yes. a great job with our, our gifts that we identifying our gifts. And, um, it, was, it was good. Thank you. Praise good. for the leadership seminar we did yesterday. What else? Um, well, last week he was in church, 
church, and they were still running diagnostic tests. And I asked Gail to report me, and I don't have information. I'm assuming he as well. Let me do the Elaine update if you don't get these texts. This is Sunday morning. Uh, Doug says, I'm going to send this out even though I haven't talked to her yet this morning. She's been sleeping like a log since I arrived here around 6.30. I do believe she is getting back to her normal schedule that is sleeping late. She did have a great day yesterday, and I expect the same today. If anything changes after she wakes up, I'll do another update. Uh, for now, just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Your prayers is what has helped not only Elaine, but our whole family come to terms with this. Enjoy your worship day, and God bless you. My best understanding and interpretation is that Sunday is visitation all day and they would be okay with some visitors today after she's had some, a couple of great days. That's my best understanding. I encourage you to just text or call him and make sure, but that's my understanding. That's my best guess. There were some Sundays I'm like, I don't think so. Today, my guess is got a good chance. Well, let's take these prayers and those we have unspoken in our hearts and minds and bring them before the Lord. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you again for all the graces, for the peace, and for the gifts that you give us, Lord. We thank you for the, the amazing ways you move when you move in small ways in people's lives, just by one simple interaction, and by the ways you move throughout the cosmos to create new realities previously unimagined. Father, we lift up these folks and these individuals and these situations locally and all around the world in their name. We pray that you would bring transformation, restoration, and healing. We know you are God. We pray that you would make it visible to us so that we have yet another reason to boast solely in your name, the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would the ushers please come forward to collect today's offering? Father, we thank you so much for all that you give to us. We pray that as we take those blessings and assign them and designate them for the work and ministry of your kingdom here in Belmont, that more folks are in this area, more folks that encounter our discipleship, that they would have their eyes open to the truth of your message, that they would be able to begin to peel and break away from the false teachings that they hold in their hearts. Amen. Oh, thirsty.
Peter 1-3-3. For we did not follow clearly the five stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Here we saw that Peter received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him with a majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard his voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. But we also had a prophetic message as something completely reliable. And you will do well to pay attention to it. As to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets through him spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there were false teachers among you. They were secretly introduced to structure of heresies, even denying the sovereignty of the Lord who brought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring their way of truth in repute. In your grief, these teachers will exploit you without having to stories. Their condemnation is long has been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. These are the words for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Yes, so we're continuing in our study of the book of 2 Peter, uh, which is towards the very end of the New Testament. Last week we did the first 15 verses, and today I'm in 2 Peter chapter 1, sorry, verse 16, finishing the chapter and then borrowing from three verses of chapter 2. Remember, when scripture was, you know, being, it was collected and passed on, they didn't annotate with the numbers for like a thousand years. Those are references, kind of like a Dewey Decimal System, you know, it's just sort of whoever interpreted where numbers should fall. So you're welcome to always sort of make blocks of scripture that makes sense to you, even if the chapter, one chapter ends and then begins. All right. So last week we were talking about uh, the probability that Peter was writing his heresy. He talked a lot about the knowledge of God and having the right knowledge of God. This, this epistle, he uses that word a lot. As Christians, we seek to ground our knowledge and our truth not in our own understanding with our eyes and our ears, but rather with God's self-revelation. Jesus Christ is the source of all knowledge and understanding and the basis upon which all truth can be found of spiritual and higher things. Now, of course you can learn things through other means like science. Like science can teach you more about a disease if you do the research and the, how the, the medicine or vaccine works. Science can teach you about the components of a particular rock or mineral and how it can be used in construction. Those are, good, those are also good sources of knowledge that we would explore creation. Science is simply the exploration of God's creation. But we can't even understand God's creation. But that's really hard, right? We're not even close. How much more difficult is it to understand the Creator? Well, I would say the only way you know anything about God is that God chose to reveal something to you. And we know that God chooses to reveal because God the Father reveals Himself through the prophets. God, God in Jesus Christ reveals Himself by becoming flesh and dwelling with us. And the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, reveals to us through the gathering of the saints. So, the problem is, sometimes we forget that only God is our source of knowledge about God. And we often, it's, it's an accident sometimes, inadvertently allow 
those, the sway of those teachings and cultures and assumptions that do not conform to God's will, and we mix them in our minds. We assume that this is a value that is held by God, but truly it's held by our society or our bias, and we don't always see it. So, final verses here in chapter 1, Peter affirms to us that Jesus Christ's self and work had been visible and audible to the disciples. What he's trying to say there is that the, the, Peter and the disciples are not coming up with this on their own. They know about Christ because Christ came to them. And all they did was receive. They heard. They saw. In verse 16 he says, For we did not follow cleverly disguised myths. What Peter is saying is, we're not following a uh, victim to some sort of clever human uh, puzzle or some sort of uh, weird generated religion or belief system for someone who's thirsty for authority or, or uh, something like that. They actually heard from God because they had no other way. There was no other source that they came up with this. So this is where I want to begin personal testimony of my faith journey. And that is, as a young adult, as an, uh, as an atheist, agnostic, I had gotten curious about spirituality. I came to the admission, this is before I'm Christian, right? What raised in church. Okay. I come to the admission that there's something beyond. Like, there is something beyond the tangible, creative word. Something had to make it. It's just too perfect. I remember an astronomy class, learning about the number you know the odds that one simplest life form could be randomly created in a pool of chemicals and lit, you know, by lightning? What is it? Do you know it? Is that? It's like something so minuscule that it could only happen once in all of the universe, and then it has to survive. <laughs> they don't talk about that in the class. They just talk about how unlikely it is to create an organism from nothing. They don't talk about the odds of that organism surviving or zero <laughs> without something behind it. Um, so I understood there was something spiritual, and I was okay with that. I think at that more than 90% of human beings on earth today, even in our advanced and golden age of knowledge, believe in something spiritual. But my problem at the time was, how could I be exclusive to one faith system when there are so many? And it seems as if religions around the world cluster based on their cultural values. Right? Like Buddhism is South, South Asian. Because that's where it comes from. The Aztecs over and down in Mexico, you know, long ago, was a very American religion, you know, Central American religion. Seemed like all the religions had all enough more to do with their environment that it had anything to do with God. It seemed like they were all on the same page. How could any religion be right, but then all the others are wrong? Even if a religion doesn't preach against other religions, by declaring its truth, it is declaring all other truths false. Now, in the modern world, actually, in New England, remember we had the Puritans that came over and settled in England? And they were super hardcore biblical, like, really? You must do everything perfect or we shun you. Well, guess what happened to their children and grandchildren? They really rebelled. <laughs> and they formed a concept called Unitarianism. <laughs> Unitarianism is the idea that all religions are pointing to the same God, manifested in different cultural systems. That's a pretty big chunk of Puritan. Who would like burn you at the stake for not reading King James Version? <laughs> Unitarian, man, they, you guys don't be hard on your kids. They are going to rebel against you. <laughs> but nothing you can do about it. Alright, so Unitarianism is the idea that people all over the world are worshiping the same higher power with different traditions and cultures. So a Unitarian might think that Hindu gods are the same as Jesus, etc. Now, I'm not hating Unitarians. I know some lovely people. 
Very logical, right? That makes logical sense. But they're looking at the world and basing their understanding of God based on looking at the world. Which is what almost every human being does, right? That's what's so different about Christianity. Christianity is inherently completely illogical human brain makes absolutely no sense. It was criticized heavily by the Romans for making utterly no sense. Think of it. We have a trinity. It's one God. Three persons. One God, three persons. Are we monotheistic? No. We have three persons. Are we polytheistic? No. We have one God. No sense at all. You won't find a single other religion that has a problem understanding how their God was made, what their God is comprised of, and what their God or gods do. You will not find one. Trinitarian monotheism is the term, if anyone was wondering. It's a Jeopardy question. The Trinity is a mystery. God is one and three at the same time. God is inherently relational within itself. Makes utterly no sense to the human brain. There is absolutely no natural world equivalent of Trinity. When we say Trinity is like this, or Trinity is like that, we can get kind of close to under. There is nothing in the created order that looks like Trinity. When I teach Trinity, uh, pe people say, oh, it's like uh, water and ice and water vapor, like three forms, but no, not quite. Um, the best explanation I have is music, and I'm going to do a, a really bad job of this. Is this on? Good. So like if you had a chord, and assume that this is in tune, like if that were a good chord, that's probably the best analogy for Trinity, that you can... You can hear all three different notes, but they make one sort of harmonious sound. <laughs> Still, not like God. There is no human logical equivalent, yet it is what we proclaim. Forget the fact that God became human, right? That God had all the power, all the power, and decided, let me constrain myself to a human being, and not even, not even a powerful one. Let me be a poor, impoverished Jew. Someone asked me the other day, why do people hate Jews? There's a million reasons why people hate Jews, but it's usually historical. They have been the world's scapegoat for thousands of years. And when Jesus was around, it was true even then. You know how, why is this one kid in the class always picked on for years and years? It's the same reason. They're just a historical scapegoat. God decided to become a poor Jew. If I were God, I would come and I would rule the world. And I would have a big castle and he would do this and I would do that and I would never die. You know, right? Like that, of course he wouldn't do that. Or if I were benevolent, I would come and I would fix everything. I would heal every single person. Is that what Jesus does? Why doesn't a loving God just eradicate everything? There is no logic in it. Well, human logic. There's none. Oh. And then there's this. And then God let us kill him. We don't say that enough. You know, the Times article back in the 60s, from the 70s said, God is dead. Then a few years later, God's not dead. Y'all, we already killed God. He came back to life. That's the story. God let his own created order kill him, destroy him, humiliate him, reject him, his own friends rejecting him. Three times. Is there a God anywhere in the pantheon all around the world that would allow anything like this? 
Naysayers say things like, oh, well, there's a virgin birth in Zoroastrianism. Good job. Great. You've just destroyed our whole religion? No. Sure, there are things in common with other traditions. Yeah, there's a flood narrative in other cultures. Sure. Maybe it just happened. <laughs> or maybe it's just wisdom that spread. I mean, like the story happened and then it got passed down. You know, maybe it just happened and spread. You're not going to find any faith system on earth with riddled with all the craziness that Christianity has. And yet, faith in Christ transforms the most unlikely people. The people who no other religion wanted. It's a grace that makes no sense. No religious system in the world is going to allow forgiveness for the absolute worst offenders in humanity. As much as we hate figures like Hitler or Stalin, we have to admit that on their deathbeds, if they had truly repented, God would have made a place for them. No matter what. I don't think they did based on the courts. <laughs> okay, I'm just saying this. But my point is, we have to admit that and we do. No other system does. Mm. The gospel message of Jesus Christ is one that will continue to disrupt and challenge our world. It is impossible to reconcile Christianity with the logic of the world around us in order to keep that message preserved and true. For me, personally, Christianity was so acceptable because it was so profoundly illogical. Because if something we can't possibly understand created us, then I would expect that God to have some ideas I didn't think of. Right? Right? Okay. He gives them manna. <laughs> that makes sense. But others, why he would pick the Jews, the, the scapegoat of the world, right? Mm. Jesus allows himself to be completely and utterly empty in a way, sacrificing himself in a way that we could not possibly sacrifice. You could say, well, I could give my life for someone I love. Yeah, but you don't have all that Jesus has. You didn't have as much to lose. You, you didn't, weren't stainless and perfect. You weren't fully innocent. The way that Jesus pours himself out is in a way that our beings could not possibly do because us as a structure as a human being, as a biological and spiritual creature, we can't pour ourselves out the way Jesus did. We can't even truly understand the one event that we talk about the most and understand the most. It's not that he just died and was crucified. It wasn't just that he gave up the breath. It's that he had the whole world. He was God. It had to be infinitely more difficult. Something else. I've studied other religious systems before, mostly since, right? Outside of Judeo Christian world. Have you ever, have you ever really read or have you ever talked to missionaries, like Mormon missionaries? Have you ever talked to them before? I got one of the customers. Is that on YouTube? Uh, it didn't happen. Before you <laughs> it didn't happen. Alright. Um, encouraging, encouraging that may work, that's a gray area, and we'll admit there's gray. <laughs> you know, Mormon theology has an answer for everything. Nothing is left unanswered. Fun fact, the original Book of Mormon, which is available in full text online, because it's, you know, historic, 
has been modified over 500 times to correct its internal inconsistencies. We're like, like they would have a, a person's name, but they meant another one because they all sound the same. They had to, to by divine inspiration, like correct the error. I don't mean retranslate. They won't let you do that. Because 18, 1820s English is the God's language, right? Translations are fine. No, they actually changed the original text because there were internal historical inconsistencies. 500 alterations. Religious systems desire internal consistency and always have the right information and have everything perfect. Most religious systems, such as Mormonism or Jehovah's Witness belief system or Islam, were written, the entire Holy Scripture was written by one person or a very close group of people. And we won't know for sure. We don't know how many people helped, you know, do that. But it's all written at the same time. The Bible is the only major religion in the world that's actually like a religion as opposed to like a wisdom culture where its texts span over 2,000 years and it's archaeologically verified. Hundreds and hundreds of people were involved in the writing of scripture, divinely inspired, divinely uh, 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 discerned as well. Many of those texts were formed and shaped by God's hand over time. And they have proven over and over and over again to be inspirational to the world and to transform the earth into something we could not imagine. Nothing has been invented like the Christian and the scriptures, all of the Testament. Nothing. It takes a small God to inspire one person to write a book. It takes a really big God to get that number of people to agree on something that is so powerful. Let's go down to verses 20 and 21 of 2 Peter 1. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, because no prophecy ever came by human will, but men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. No prophecy ever came by human will. The scriptures that we have, the prophecies and the stories and the recordings, we only know things. We only have these writings. We only know these things because God chose to reveal them to us. If God had not revealed that fact, we would not know it. And due to God's cosmic nature, of course, we see that God's logic is so very different. Most other religions make a cognitive sense when compared to Christianity. Christianity is the only religion that still cannot answer most, many of its own questions. People still debate. There's still debate upon dozens or hundreds of issues because God uses the Holy Spirit to work through his people, which means no logical sense. The problem lies, though, sometimes we get tempted as Christians, don't we? We get confident. It creeps up on us sometimes. Sometimes we do it intentionally. We get confident, and we say, I know, I know this, I know that, I know this, I know that. I'm doing pretty good. I'm on a roll. Hot dog. And I start relying on my perception of the world. And as a charismatic young preacher, you can rely on that as well. And or someone else, a televangelist, and mine. And then large portions of Christendom become believing certain things based on 
human logic. Well, that makes sense. Everybody. And we tiptoe into heresy, into false teaching. Sometimes it's blatantly intentional, but other times it's really not. One of the biggest temptations for us as Christians is to be tempted to rely on our own understanding of God. We're called to let the scripture read us and tell us what it's saying, not the other way around. But it's so tempting. And we've done it through history. We've done it haven't we? And we've done it not in small ways. We've done it in colossal ways. How many people in the last 2,000 years have written long theological explanations as to why human slavery is God's acceptable practice on earth? That's the best alternative. There be all kinds of slavery. Slavery is so diverse. Humans are good at creating evil. Slavery can be not so bad to absolutely horrible. Right? It can be anywhere in between. You can have economic slavery. You can physically own legal slavery. What is it in a society when a man marries a woman and she becomes his property? Is that slavery? The answer is yes. But it wasn't viewed that way. That's called slavery. For hundreds of years, Christians have held that women couldn't have any leadership in the church. Even though you have the prophet Deborah in Judges. It's there. <laughs> not even far, not even hiding. It's not like one of those weird little corners of books of scripture that only pastors read. It's Deborah. <laughs> it was funny at the retreat yesterday. Because I told them, all right, we're going to talk about Exodus 31 and the people building the tabernacle. And they were like, oh, Lord, I hope he doesn't read the whole description. <laughs> yes, I've done that. I've studied the description of the tabernacle. It's quite uh, 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 thrilling and invigorating if you have lots of time and nothing else to do. Uh, but why are the curtains purple? And why is that gold and not silver? Okay, I've been to sleep already. It's great. Um, for hundreds of years, Christians believed that it was justified to declare an offensive war as an unprovoked aggressor. We're going to attack you. You didn't do anything to us. We're not at odds. We're just going to do it to get land. Ever read, ever, ever read the history of Europe? <laughs> justified by me. Well, they don't interpret baptism quite the same way, so they must all die. No. When Jesus said, go baptize the nations, he didn't say, when he said make disciples, he didn't say, and if they do not adhere perfectly to your very precise understanding, then slaughter them. Things the Bible never said. Doesn't even hint at. We did that. When I say we like Christians have done that. In the 16th century, they were slaughtering each other based on ideas around baptism. Fundamentally, baptism is a uniting event. The scripture says there is one baptism. You can't decide to have a second one. <laughs> you don't get to decide that. There's one. Oh, and then there's, oh, I love the communion fights, right? Even churches today, you can't take communion, you're not here. I'm pretty sure when Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, he didn't say, and you better perfectly understand this mystery and recite it without fault, or else I shall send you away. You, he didn't send Judas away. When people ask me why we go open the table to everyone, I say, he didn't send Judas away. How do we guard against false teachings? Because these false teachings, they come in by people of faith. We allow them, right? Like we slowly and over time allow them to enter the church. What's the 
difference between a false prophet and someone who just made a mistake? Doesn't everyone get the opportunity to grow in faith and make, make mistakes? Yeah. Verses 2 and 3, chapter 2. Even so, many will follow their licentious ways, and because of these teachers, the way of truth will be maligned, and in their greed, they will exploit you with deceptive words. Their condemnation, pronounced against them long ago, has not been idle, and their destruction is not asleep. People make mistakes. People like your own pastor makes theological and interpretive mistakes. Not many. Yeah, I do. We're in it together, first of all. We make mistakes. You make mistakes. You have incorrect thoughts about God. So do I. Welcome to the club. Guess what percentage of us do? Thank you. Good. A hundred. Wow. We get a star. Hooray. <laughs> right. We're all doing the exact same thing. That's okay. Did God say, go and make disciples and you better get everything right? Nope. He said, go and make disciples. And then, the, and then the scripture in Matthew 28 says, but some doubt. And he said, go and make disciples. But some that I doubt. All right. I can work with that. <laughs> if they doubt, you know they don't understand. That's okay. When you sometimes, when I'm leading the church and I'm just like, yeah, go do that, you're fine. And you're like, but I need help, Pastor. Well, I can help you when you go. Know. Okay, well, go make disciples. And you're like, I'm just, Pastor, you're just being flippant and not giving me attention. No. <laughs> Jesus did that. He's like, just go for home. Two by two. You know. <laughs> go now, go heal people. No, really. You too have the power to go to your school. You go to the same school. As believers in Christ, you can go to your friends who are in trouble. You can lay hands on them and you can forgive them their sins and they will be loosed. You can do that. Even if you just barely started coming to church and just have a little bit of faith. You can go to your friend who's struggling, who's depressed. And you can go and pray over them and loose them their sins and it will happen. That's it. Do you understand? Of course not. I don't understand that. You don't know more than me. You just think you do. <laughs> you know what? That's fine. You can, you can think you know. Go, just go. Go. Just go make the silence. Having a mistaken understanding is different. As a group, as we stay connected to the church, in the local church and the church all around the world, across the denominations, we have to keep our shelves sharp, right? Iron sharpens iron. And that's how we're going to fix that problem. But if you have a false prophet who's trying to sway you, you will know by their actions. And their greed, in their greed, they will exploit you with deceptive words. Oh, in verse 2. Even so, many will follow their licentious ways. Bad. Licentious is bad. And because of these teachers, the way of truth will be maligned. They will cause bad things to the truth. Those are bad words. Those who try to deceive and purposely uh, lead you will typically have an agenda that is shameful or harmful. They will exploit you and take advantage of you to fulfill their greed. Watch their actions. Do the actions of these people that you are <clears throat> hey, your Sunday school teacher, focus more on them. The actions of the people that you're listening preachers on TV, what do their actions say? Are they up there an uh, evangelist and the, oh, we got to fund this ministry and this is wonderful, and then they go home in a $10 million mansion? Or do they go home into a, a house that is, you know, upper middle class or lower? What's their action look like? That's how you know. Is your teacher more likely to assist someone who asks for help or gossip about them? Is your teacher more likely to take more resources or to contribute more resources? Is 
your teacher seeking to twist the gospel for any political agenda? Or is he or she merely understanding the world through that particular lens? You can have a political lean. But are, is that your problem? That's different. You could be convinced through your lens. But is that your, what you're worshiping? Oh, and I have news for you all. You're all teachers and prophets. The words that we're studying in 2 Peter apply to you too. All of you are the ones who will be teaching and directly in contact with people in your family, in your community, in your work. All those whom you encounter, you are the ones carrying the message. Steward of that message, or is Peter rebuking you? In the name of the Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's stand together as we sing the Spirit song. Thank you.